Oh, cool. Well, my name is Nate Presnell. I'm a rising 2L the University of, Sturm College, uh, University of Denver Sturm College of Law. I've been working as an extern over the summer with Carl Dakin, so this is my first time presenting here, and I just get to talk about uh, how we can combine whole life insurance with opportunity zone funding. So let's get started. So first off, as we know, through an opportunity zone investment with capital gains, from those investors goes into an opportunity zone fund then those, that money itself is deployed into an opportunity zone business, either for a business itself or a real estate play. So now what we're looking at here would be the business itself, getting that money from the investor and then buying whole life insurance and using, their, using that insurance to, in, to insure the investor himself or her or whoever part of the entity itself. So then over the time, money would be borrowed against this policy, policy itself. Again, going, as we were showing earlier, using a different amount, like a higher amount of capital in the initial time to reinvest itself into the business, which goes into this slide. So this money itself could be in, combined with either an equipment lease or a commercial mortgage that itself is used by the Opportunity Zone business to buy assets. And then out of this, through the revenues that the Opportunity Zone business would be gaining, either through rent or through different income from the business itself, it would be paying the premium into this insurance policy throughout the, throughout the term of the investment. Now also, more, as more cash is built up, more money can be borrowed itself from the whole life insurance policy. And this again would be used to invest into different expenses for the business itself, whether it's improvements on the property or investments further in the business to keep developing it. Now this has to be continued throughout the 10-year policy, throughout the 10-year cycle. Just keep it going, keep paying the premiums and keep the investment flow going through the investment to be connected with, with, the, with the investor itself. Now at the end of this 10 years, the business itself will be sold. And now at this point, new money can either be raised or it can be sold off. Now at this point, the investors of the Opportunity Zone Fund will either, be bought, will either buy out of the Opportunity Zone business or they could continue on with the business itself. But either way, at this point, the gains themselves, the original ones will be distributed at the discount, plus any extra gains on the business or the property itself will get the tax-free benefits. But then not only to that, at this point, the investors themselves now have the insurance policy that's been paid for and used for the 10-year period. So they've already been paying premiums and building equity within that fund. At the same time, the Opportunity Zone business gets access to money they can keep taking from the investment, keep investing in their own business. And at the same time, it gives, the, it gives the Opportunity Zone investor a reason, not just for the ROI from the business itself, but gives them an added ROI in a way of getting their own insurance policy combined with it. So the idea is to kind of, in, it's just a creative method, a creative way of allowing more capital flow to be poured into the Opportunity Zone business itself, but also giving opportunities and an investor an increased reason for actually staying with the investment, an increased reason for letting the Opportunity Zone business use them as part of the whole life insurance policy. So any questions on the combination of Opportunity Zone uh, Investing with the, the policy? The yeah. Lots. <laughs> <laughs> so, investor has, say, he's got half a million dollars coming out of something else, he doesn't want to pay, pay taxes on yeah. So, without dovetailing it with a whole life policy, he puts that half a million into a fund, and that fund goes and buys business or real estate, and he gets all the advantages of, of that. But he still does that, but the fund? Yes, yeah, the opportunities. So naturally, the opportunity zone business is separate than the opportunity zone fund itself. So the fund goes into the business and allows that person themselves to be the one to invest in the whole life insurance policy. 
And at that point, then they also name the investor as part of that policy. Yeah, so the, the business will buy like a key man policy mm -hmm. on the investor. You have to meet a business purpose limit. Mm -hmm. So if they're a completely passive, unattached kind of an investor, you may not make the business test. But if you put them on a board of advisors, if they're part of the management team, uh, they're involved with some business activity, like, to the business itself. It's kind of like what we learn later. As long as you don't want them dead necessarily, if you can connect them legally like to the business itself and have an interest in it. Right. So what happens is then the, the investor becomes the insured. So upon their death, they get the benefit of the policy. So the death benefit follows them. Okay. But during the term of this policy, the 10-year term, the business is borrowing against the cash value up to the maximum cash value that exists in that policy. So you can borrow from it, so you, you invest in the fund, the fund puts it into an opportunity zone business or property, buys the whole life policy in the name of the investor, and then borrows against that and then leverages that with a commercial mortgage or any form of debt financing to get the maximum utility of that money. Now at this point in time, the cash value is zero in the policy, but as it pays a premium, it bumps it back up, borrows again, and it keeps doing this. But over the life of 10 years, the cash value will typically uh, grow faster than what you, you can need to borrow against it, because you're also matching any borrowing with the revenue from the business. And, and you're, you can actually maximize it. You would pay as much of the business expenses by borrowing uh, as you need to. So uh, the key things we're looking at, we're still working on some of the formulas here, but um, ordinarily if you had half a million you would, and you bought a whole life policy, uh, you would have to have, you know, you're not going to get the full access to that cash. Uh, the 75-25 rule would apply. So roughly $125,000 would go against the basic premium and you'd only have 375 of the 500 within the business to go invest in something, okay? And, and so as you're doing your planning, you've got to make a difference between the basic premium and the paid up premium, and know that there's enough in the paid up premium and the cash value that you can start whatever project is that you're looking at out of the gate. Now, every year after that, as the revenues come in from your project, assuming you get to revenue by year, end of year one, uh, those revenues combined with whatever you need to borrow become the cash that you have available to start and push that business as hard as possible. So uh, your goal is to try to figure out how to make maximum use of the cash value uh, while building the value in the policy. And as Sean was explaining, because they treat the loan over here and the value of the insurance over here, even though you're borrowing the money, it doesn't stop the growth of value in that policy for the 10-year time period. So um, we've run some models, and Jonathan had one, but he didn't get it to me <laughs> for tonight. But um, these are different models. Oh, right. <laughs> uh, um, we're trying to create what we're calling a, a $1 million uh, project model that starts with something like a $100,000 investment that goes into a fund and is used to, to buy a policy, and then from there is leveraged up by 900000 to a million dollar project. And then go through the 10 year life cycle of moving the money in and out of the policy so you can see what you end up with. And uh, based upon certain revenue capabilities, which is one of the key variables, how much, yeah. how much revenue is this business spinning off, uh, with a, a certain reasonable uh, revenue stream, you may be able to buy down that mortgage to zero in less than the 10-year time period, use your excess money to pay down on the loan. You still may have a loan existing at the end of 10 years, but you'll have a net-net cash value in your policy, and you can have a tremendously high death benefit at that same time. So from your, your investor's standpoint, you say, well, I can give you $500,000 and I get this much of this project, standard equity investment type of a deal. Now, the good news is that any gain in that's tax-free at the end of the 10-year time period. That's great. That gives you another reason to make this better. But now we're saying, in addition to that, you've got cash sitting in a policy 
that the business has access to to continue to borrow against as long as it wants to. But uh, if the person should die, your investor should die, um, then that whole death benefit pays off the loan, so that's erased, and the rest goes to their heirs, whoever that may be. So from an investor standpoint, I'm like, so I made my investment, but now I also have a major death benefit sitting over here that goes to whoever uh, I want to point it to. That's a really nice addition to my standard investment. In a lot of ways, that kind of alleviates the fears of having such a long, long-term loan or investment. Like Ten years for a lot of people may seem like a long time, but if you have the added potential payout of something to ensure like this investment won't go sour in ten years, yeah, it could do the difference. So uh, this is what we're looking at: is uh, in a million-dollar model, depending upon your loan-to-value ratio, how much debt you can take out based upon the amount of cash you've got to work with looking at the revenue that's spun off by the business enterprise, whether it's rents on apartments or it is have production facilities. sales net profits from sales, however that works. And, and then you run the model and you say, here's what I could come up with by the end of the time. And if I'm borrowing against the policy aggressively, that allows me to push the growth of this business, particularly of those that are going to have increasing capital you requirements. you get better equipment to help develop. Right. So you can, you can basically increase the value of your investment so that when it's sold at the end of 10 years, you've got a higher net gain from the tax incentive. And so going back to real estate, so if we're, if we're building and selling buildings, units, townhomes, but as long as the, the fund that owns that real estate keeps that money in, inside the fund, like we talked about with the phone, you need to reinvest right back in the same project because it's a phase project, right in the same opportunity zone, or does something else with it. It's fine. You can you can sell off assets that a fund owns as long as profit from those assets don't get distributed outside of the fund. That's correct. So if you're if you're buying real estate, uh, you hold it for three years, you sell it, uh, you have 12 months to do like a 1031 rollover and invest that back into a, a different opportunity zone property or business. It doesn't have to be the same kind, so we're not doing some of those limitations, but you would invest the entirety of that over uh, into a new project so it continues to work in the distressed economic community. So in a 10-year time period, we've had real estate people talk about doing anywhere from two to five deals in a 10-year time period. It depends on how quickly they can turn properties. Or if they're doing fix and flips, they might be doing three a year or something, they might do 30 uh, within a 10-year time period. And at the end of the 10 years, all that money is sitting in the company, and then you basically buy out the fund interest, like buy the stock down, that constitutes a distribution, or you sell the business, you just push the money through the fund, and all the capital gains on that is tax-free. And you're sitting on net-net cash value, uh, in the fund that is available for someone to use, which could be changed based on the policy. In 10 years, I don't need any more. I could somehow transfer that over to the insured, and the insured could take it over from that point. So I could be handing them cash that's tax-free, I believe. I have to check on that one. Uh, if we assign over the, the value of the policy to the insured, would that be a tax event? I don't believe so. Okay. Oh. We'll write that, that one down because yeah, yeah. I know I'm going to be asked about it as huh. soon as this program is over. Yeah. And, and the person has a death benefit sitting there, and we're talking millions of dollars of death benefits. So if they should happen to die at any time, this thing is generating enough dividends and cash value to pay the premiums. And so they could be sitting there without having to do anything more for the rest of the policy uh, except letting that thing grow, and it can continue to grow. Wait, I didn't follow that last thing. So let's say after 10 years, you, your, your cash value is down for each, your death benefit's great, but the policy itself, 4.5% that it's growing is enough to pay for the premiums for life. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. So you've got a So that investor doesn't have to, act in, in year 11, be like, oh crap, now i got to come up with $50,000 to pay this premium because the, the policy is paying for itself, basically. So one of the things Jonathan mentioned, which I didn't get to ask you, so surprise question, but uh, um, we think it's possible that you can construct a real estate deal with a guaranteed payout at the end of 10 years on a, a 
level of return on investment. So that using the insurance policy uh, essentially as a hedge, uh, I could tell someone, uh, we're going to guarantee you no less than 8% ROI per year on your investment in this real estate uh, because we ran it through a policy of this nature. We can use the cash and policy to make sure they hit their 8% and then we're still got access to that money, the rest of the money to do the rest of the deal. So that's why I'm saying that, that we get four or five steps down the road, we have a basic model, uh, which we're doing at $1 million project and we're gonna then do 20 or 30 variables on that for greater dollar amounts, all we do is scale it. But if we go from a, a 90, 10 loan to value to a 20, 80 or something, we'll, we'll figure all that out. And then we'll figure out where the sweet spot is and what kind of projects are best. And, and then we're going to test it uh, on this project in Florence so you get to see how it works. Yep. Okay. Let's do this. Let's take a, a five minute break.